want to welcome you to St. Luke's Virtual Worship, the 17th day of May. And I want to welcome you, whether you are a member of our community who has gathered in this space, or whether you are a member of the wider community. I know that we have viewers from all over the Atlantic provinces and, and over in, in all across the country and into other continents even. So I want to welcome you to worship today as we, we are gathered to celebrate love. Just a few updates about what's coming up in our services in the next little while. The Council of St. Luke's has been having some conversation about, um, about future plans and things are not settled yet, but we we're going to let you know as we know what's going on. It's going to be a little while yet before churches are allowed to open. Um, so we've made the decision that we're going to be doing virtual worship right through to the end of August and probably beyond. So you will be able to tune into our services all summer long, and we hope to see you there. As for next week, the, um, we're, the outreach committee is going to be bringing um, some conversation about mission and service and the work of, of the Mission and Service Fund of the United Church here in our city and all across the country and the world. And so we hope that you join us to listen to that. The week after that is the 31st of May and Pentecost Sunday, and we're going to have a birthday party for the church. Um, and then the Sunday after that, being the first Sunday of the month, um, it, we're going to be celebrating communion by Zoom. So that's just a little update of what's coming up, and we hope that you will join us for all of these services and listen to the gifts of a lot of our different church people here as we present to you the word in different ways. Now let's just settle our hearts. The light of Christ is with us, within us and without. In the faces of those who we may not see in person, but love nonetheless. For where love is, there is Christ. And I ring the singing bowl to call you to worship. The pleasing sound in God's ears says that we are here. For wherever two or three are gathered by any medium, Christ is among us, and God its love is there. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Loving Lord, you have showered your world with faith, hope, and love. Help us to be faithful to you, to offer hope to those in need, and to love all your children. Amen. Thank you. 
Today's reading is from the 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at the first verse. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not exist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. Our second reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 12. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, what commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. May God add his blessing to these holy readings. Amen.
Last week, I started the conversation about the large and thriving church in the Greek city of Corinth that grew so fast and included so many people from so many different walks of life that after being church together for a time, they found out that they had different values and different understandings about what it meant to follow this Jesus guy in the midst of a surrounding pagan culture. And I also talked a little bit about how Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is something that was not ever meant to be a, a great theological treatise with all the answers about how we shall be Jesus' people from now until eternity. Instead, what Paul was doing was writing a letter to try to help these people find a middle ground between their conflicts, not to cover over their conflicts, but to give them some methods about how to be in a community where conflict was addressed and dealt with so that everybody got to a better place. I really think it's an important point, though, to realize that this book was not written as a, a sort of a received vision of the text from God, um, or, the, or the way to be a Christian. Instead, it was all about making it up as he went along. And I think that is a really important point because I think we treat the Bible with too much respect. I remember a bunch of years ago, before I went to, um, to go get my MDiv, um, I had a Bible study at the church that we were attending um, on the authority of Scripture. Um, some of you may have done that, that study as well. It would have been, I don't know, 25 years ago now. It's hard to think of that, but there it is. And I was the youngest person in the room, Pretty rare, I guess, for people in their 20s to be interested in such uh, lofty topics as the authority of, of Scripture. And I can remember when we were asked the question, what does the authority of Scripture mean to you? That I said to the crowd, well, I think that the authority of Scripture is kind of like the authority that a really good piece of literature has. That what it is is, it is somebody, people telling stories about how they managed the expectations of faith and, and how to be faithful people. And somewhere in that story of, of their experience, you might be able to find some wisdom. And the other participants told me, you are wrong. That's not what it is at all. The Bible is a rule book. It's a rule book that tells you how to live in black and white, set out with thou shalt and thou shalt not. And then a little bit later in the discussion, we were asked whether or not we ever read the Bible. And I said, sometimes. And the people who, read, who considered the Bible to be a rule book said, never. So you're telling me that the Bible is a rule book, but you never read it. I sometimes wonder, and I've said for my number of years, I've wondered whether or not perhaps they didn't read the rule book because they were afraid what rules they find inside. I'm still willing to defend this understanding of authority. Because I have great respect for Paul's ability to roll up his sleeves and handle conflict in the church without flinching for the sake of the gospel, which in Greek means good news. To try to bring together such different groups of people from all walks of life and teach them that they have to learn with, to live with each other and value each other's contributions for the sake of the good news. And this goes well beyond tolerance, that most Canadian of all virtues, where we don't make any barriers to entry and we find a way to put up with our neighbors even if they really aren't our kind of people and we don't hang with them any other time than when we're in the building. That, that kind of tolerance is not what we're talking about. This is a deeper thing, a creative kind of force that allows people who are very different to engage with each other and tussle it out and, and, and find some common ground. I've often been struck over the years as I've listened to the, and read a bit about the history of rock and roll, how many of those great bands, um, the iconic bands um, from the 60s and 70s and 80s and probably today too, um, so often don't get along. In fact, sometimes the fights can be epic. Um, and I think what's going on there is that you've got a lot of creative energy flowing. These people are trying to figure out how to get into some deep truths. And there's disagreements with the band about how to do that, about 
um, how far to go, about what lifestyles to live while you do it, about um, who we really are and what we're really trying to, to, to tell our public and our fans what's going on. And those kinds of deep creative differences come out in the same kind of conflicts as were coming out in the, in the community that Paul was living with. And so I think that if we also wish to have a creative, um, a creative experience, a creative community that is making up wonderful things as we go along, we too need to learn to live in that tension. Well, Paul has a solution. A name for the thing that we need to be able to negotiate these shoals of conflict and different opinions and different backgrounds and all that stuff. The name for it is love. One of the problems with reading the text that Edna read for us just a few minutes ago is that 1 Corinthians 13 is a, is a passage from the Bible that has been completely co-opted by the marriage industry. Um, if you go to a lot of weddings in the course of the summer, um, there may not be quite so many this summer, but um, as it is, if you go to a lot of weddings, you will hear 1 Corinthians 13 read all the time. It, I totally get that. It is a great piece. And it has the advantage of hardly mentioning God at all. If you, you know, for those who are looking for a secular wedding, it looks like it's a great piece that that talks about the idea of love without getting too much into that religious stuff. You know, we don't want to go too far in that direction. But the problem with putting Paul's word in the context of weddings is that that context is a time when, well, most weddings, when they happen, are the, this is the height of love in a new couple's relationship. They are so in love, reality has not yet set in. No, indeed, they are dressed in the most expensive clothing they will ever own in their entire life. They are surrounded by their best friends and by their families who love them and are wishing the best for them. And so it's really easy to say at that time that they should be patient and kind and not want their own way. I mean, that's easy to say on such a romantic day, but this is a sentimental reality, not yet weighed down by the burden of reality. They have not yet hit the 2 a.m. feeding with a colicky baby when the partner is not yet home, even though they promised they were only going to spend an hour with of the guys after the, after the game. Nor have they yet hit those shoals when, the, when, when they are checking out for the 200th time that their partner says, can we talk about the relationship? Really, Paul's conversation about love was not in the context of a perfect love, but in the context of a boxing ring with a couple of MMA fighters going the distance. And it was like Paul standing between them and saying to one and to the other, you know, with a little patience and kindness, I think you could work it out. Paul was a brave man. I don't think I would have wanted to be standing there. The community of the Corinthians was battling. They had some serious, nearly irreconcilable dif differences, and each side wanted Paul to tell the other side that they were wrong. And instead, Paul said, all you need to do is just love each other. Love each other the way that, that each other is. Don't try to change the other person. Try to know them. Don't insist on your own way. Listen to what they have to say. Wish the best for each other while still respecting your dis differences. And I am in awe of Paul's faith here, that he looked at a church that was fighting it out and said, I think a little love can fix this problem. How often in our relationships do we rush to ease the tension, to quiet things down and, 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 and just, just not go there? And of course that doesn't work because if we don't resolve the conflicts, the issue just waits until the next time there's a point of tension and up it crumbs again. I worry about that sometimes in, in the, uh, because I think that if we're dealing with conflict by burying it, it is, a, it is a mechanism that empowers bullies. 
because they quickly learn that in a conflict-phobic community, all they have to do is threaten to start a conflict and everyone else will back down. I think that uh, a friend of mine used to call this uh, management by atrocity, which is to say that um, if I want you to do something, I'll ask you to do it, and if you don't do it, I'll commit an atrocity. But Paul does not back down. Paul is completely willing to hang in there and talk about what's really going on. He is so concerned about the souls of the people of Corinth that he's willing to endure a little bit of, a little bit of discomfort in the messy middle to help them get to a better place. There are no winners or losers in Paul's church, only family. I yearn for a community like that. A community where we can share our differences and, and, and instead of being criticized, just be loved. Don't we all look for that? I'm reading a book right now by Larry Crabb called Becoming a True Spiritual Community. And while I find his theology a little bit conservative for me, I find his vision of what the church can be as riveting. He talks about a, pu a pure spiritual community, being a place where we, tr we don't try to fix broken people. Instead, what we do is we band together as a people where we are all broken in our own ways. His background is as a psychotherapist, but what he has found in his career is psychotherapy was not healing people. His research showed him that the only lasting effect of psychotherapy had nothing to do with the skill of the therapist or the type of therapy that they were doing. Instead, the quality of the one-on-one -on -one connection between the therapist and the client was what determined whether or not the client got better. In other words, it was the quality of the love relationship between the two of them, that, that not the quality of the work that they were doing, that had a healing effect. Crabb says that in communities where people expect him to be the expert with all the answers, the pressure drives him out of authentic living and into performance. I can totally relate to that, got to say, sitting here with a camera as I'm talking, and how it's all about performance. It's like, is my hair good today? Have I sucked my gut in enough? How's my posture doing? I, I'm, you know, all these things are very important, the consultants will tell you, in order to be able to give an effective uh, presentation. I mean, I've been all over the internet where they're saying, here's how to point your camera and do your makeup so you look good on Zoom. Have you not seen these things? But the problem is, is if we move our best work into performance, then what happens is we are not really there. Only the image we are trying to create of ourselves, a better self somehow by the criteria of the world. But that's not what Jesus wants from us. What Jesus wants from us is for us to be there and be real. And what Crabb found was that when he confessed his brokennesses in a community that was willing to not fix him, but just hear him, and then in turn he heard their brokennesses, a, a, a connection was forged and a community was built that was better than any other he had experienced in all his work in the church. I think that's what all of us want, really. We want to be loved as we are. And that's Paul's answer. It's not a cheap romantic love. It's not there to be tossed aside should it not work out. It's a love that's willing to stand in the ring and take a few blows for the sake of the hope that we can get to a better place if we just hang in there. A love that doesn't focus on improving the beloved, but is willing to create some safe space for the beloved to be fully themselves, and also some safe space for us to be fully ourselves. And in the place in the middle, as we work out our creative differences, something is created which is bigger than either of us could have been alone. Now extend that to a community of people all doing that work. And you start to see a vision of a community that can change the world. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this stuff is hard work. There are very few fairy tales in the end in the trenches of love. 
But let me assure you, this is one fight that is worth it. Because the result is nothing le less than for us to become our truest selves and to build a church that is better than we could have imagined. And that church will then be able to spread the good news that God loves you more than you love yourselves and Christ is alive in the world. Hallelujah. Amen. prayer time at St. Luke's and we remember when we used to be able to get together and we will again and at those times when we're together we hug and we talk and we listen and we sing and we pray and we cry and we touch bumped elbows when it was time and then we touch toes when it was time and in these days it's time that we're online but our love is the same would you join me and bow together as we pray Loving God, we thank you for calling us into a relationship with you and setting us in the world you love. Through our prayers, we bring to you our doubts and fears, our joys and our concerns, and our deepest longings for your world. Reconciling God, we pray for our family and friends, those far away and those close by for any who are estranged from us, and for those whom we depend upon daily. In these days of physical distancing, keep us close to each other through all the means of communications that are available. 
bless and protect relationships that are joyful and life-giving. Where relationships are strained, bring understanding and new possibility. Help us all give thanks for the love that is still possible among us all. Guiding God, we pray for public officials, politicians, and all who serve the public day by day. In these times of new challenges, guide each leader to uphold standards of good service above personal gain. Give wisdom to make faithful decisions and courage when those decisions are unpopular. Create a spirit of cooperation and understanding among our leaders so that our communities and our country can flourish again. Caring God, help us to be respectful of every neighbor and treat each person we meet with a kindness that reflects your love. When we grow tired of limits on our lives, help us to remember that the limits we face in this time of this pandemic will protect the most vulnerable among us. Healing God, we pray for those who are suffering from illness or chronic conditions, for those in grief or loneliness, and for any and all who feel frustrated or overwhelmed by what they face. We remember all those who have been affected by this coronavirus, those diagnosed and now recovered, those who have died, and those whose treatments have been postponed during this pandemic. Move in each and every life with your healing grace and show signs of your presence and compassion in life-giving ways to all who suffer. Faithful God, we pray for ourselves, our family and friends, our neighborhoods and our communities. We lay before you in silence all the people and concerns on our hearts and minds this day. We are grateful that we can place all our worries and our hopes into your hands, O God, knowing that in your mercy and in your perfect time, you will hear us and respond. We pray all of these things in and through the name of Jesus, our risen Christ, who taught us to pray together. And today we begin with our parent God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now go forth into the world in the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill your high calling as servants and friends of Jesus Christ. And may the living Christ go with you. May he go behind you to support you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, within you to empower you, and ahead of you to show you the way. Amen. be done, nothing you can sing that can't be sung, nothing you can say but you can learn how to play the game, it's easy, nothing you can make that can't be made, no one you can save that can't be 
be saved Nothing you can do but you can learn how to be when time It's easy All you need is love All you need is love All you need is love 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 is all you need That is all you need. That is all you need. Love is all you need.